his mind. And let's stand to sing. mention uh, one more announcement and uh, perhaps I should wait until later in case others come in but um, <clears throat> on the 27th we're having Dr. and Mrs. Ed Powey with us for prayer meeting. That's Wednesday evening. Um, did I say October? I think I said October. <laughs> we're not talking October. I'm still thinking about the uh, uh, 75th anniversary of the church. Uh, this month, March 27th, it's a Wednesday evening, Dr. and Mrs. Ed Powey will be with us and so um, that's not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. And uh, we would strongly encourage you to be there, and not only to be there, but please be on time. Um, it is a custom of some to be, you know, straggling in, but they will be starting and we'll be holding it in the prayer room here uh, right at 7 o'clock. So please uh, join us at that time. Please be on time. And uh, 
I think it's going to be a wonderful evening. And then the following week, we'll be having Miss Joan Davenport with us, also on Wednesday evening. And whenever we have the live speakers, of course, we always encourage you, please be on time. Now let's take our Bibles and turn over to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 9. We're down in verses 26 through 28 tonight. It's the Apostle Paul having just been saved, eager to spread the gospel. Now there are those who are out trying to kill him in verses 23 through 25. And we saw last week that he was let down over the wall in a basket. We learned a number of very basic principles as we looked at those three verses last week. Number one, very clearly, God determines the length of ministry where we serve in each place. God determines the length of time that we will be there. He will either move us or he will take us by death, but he determines that length. He did it for Paul, uh, Saul still at this point. He did it for him, and uh, I suspect that Saul probably would have stayed there quite a bit longer had it not been for the attempts on his life. The second thing that we learned last week in terms of basic principles is that sometimes the very ones we are sent to reach harden their hearts to the point of no return. They harden their hearts to the point of no return. And we saw an illustration of that with Moses. The third thing that we learned last week is that God can uncover the most hidden plans when it suits his purposes. And he uses different ways of doing it. We already know from earlier chapters that the, the Christians who had been scattered around had some kind of a spy network in place. They had heard in advance not only that Saul was coming, but they had heard that he had actually received letters from the priests there in Jerusalem to capture any of the Christians who were in Damascus. That was before he got there. They already knew it. Ananias argues with God and reminds God, if you can do such a thing, that, hey, you know, he has letters from the high priest. He's here to arrest us. I'm one of the believers. I'm in serious jeopardy if this happens to me. We discover that God has many ways of revealing things to us. In that passage that we saw last week, it says, their laying in wait was known to Saul. God always alerts us to the danger when he wants us to know it. And God is certainly capable of finding ways to do that. We looked at several other passages as well. Our enemies will also keep an eye on us until they think it's time to strike. And we saw that in Acts 21, where by this time Paul goes back to Jerusalem and he is caught in the temple by some people who have seen him in the city with Trophimus and Ephesian. And they think that he's brought this Gentile into the temple. And so they cry out, they grab him, they're about to kill him when... Paul is finally rescued by the centurion and the soldiers. But we also saw that in Acts chapter 23, verse 10, we find this warfare going over Saul, where they are trying to tear him in pieces in the Sanhedrin. He goes down to stand trial. And it says, The night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so thou must bear witness in Rome. So he had that in mind when later trials came up that God was going to send him to Rome. But even in the midst of all that, there's a plot to kill his life. And yet God makes it known to Saul or to Paul. When Paul's sister son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. And then you know the amazing thing how Paul tells the guard, take this kid and take him to the chief captain, which was quite a, an odd request without telling the guard why and then the chief captain is willing to listen to a little boy who tells him that plot is going to be to kill Paul's life when the chief captain brings him down again to be examined again by the Sanhedrin. God lets his people know in advance what is necessary to protect them from dangers. We saw that the devil and his minions will spend a lot of time, money and energy to try to stop the proclamation of the gospel. It says they watched the gate day and night to kill him. And of course they had a deadline. We talked last week how they couldn't get a McDonald's hamburger or a Coke until they'd killed Paul. So either, uh, in practical matters, either they broke their oath or they starved to death. We don't know which. God didn't bother to tell us. But uh, definitely dangerous to take an oath. And we're forbidden to do so both by the Lord Jesus Christ and also by 
the Apostle James, who summarizes the words of Christ. We talked a bit about oath-bound societies last week and why a Christian should never be involved in an oath-bound society. And we noted that Masonry and Mormonism have much in common in terms of the oaths that they take. But we are not to take oaths. Jesus said so. He says, But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, neither by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. That is the command of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the God of the universe, our creator, the one who has established right from wrong, and he says, don't do it. James summarizes it, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Very important principles that we picked out last week. We won't go back over those. Number eight, our enemy, the devil, and his people are not ashamed to work together with religious people who are unsaved. And we noted how that was the case when there were those fighting against Dr. McIntyre when he was opposed to the World Council of Churches. And then God always protects his people beyond the small imaginations of the enemy. And we gave another illustration of going over a wall with the two spies who came to Jericho and saw that Rahab was a believer and became an ancestress of the Lord Jesus Christ because of her faith. Now that brings us tonight to the question when Christians don't trust you. Have you ever been in a situation you were eager to be part of a group and the people in the group sort of gave you the cold shoulder. They didn't want to bring you into the group. There was a sense of distrust that you were perhaps not really one of them. Well, that's the situation we see in verses 26 through 28 tonight. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus and he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. As we look at this passage, we discover a number of very interesting things. First of all, we see that Saul returned to the city that was most dangerous to his health, Jerusalem. He'd been threatened up in Damascus. What could he expect at Jerusalem? It says, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he came straight from Damascus after he got down off the wall. He didn't go out into the wilderness someplace. He didn't decide, I'll find a ministry where things are not so hot. He returned to the center of the conflict. He returned to the city where Christ had been crucified. He returned to the city where he himself had been involved in persecuting the believers who were there. Very interesting that he would do that. I think that tells us a number of things. Number one, not only is it immediately after an attempt on his life, but word traveled fast. Word probably reached Jerusalem in advance that Paul was on his way. Number two, God often puts us where he can test our faith and obedience. After Paul had grown some spiritually at Damascus, where he had had good fellowship and seen the stability of the body of Christ and been confirmed in his testimony, God put him next in the place where his faith and his obedience would be most severely tested. Have you ever been in a situation where your faith was severely tested? Where obedience would cost you something? At some point in your Christian life, God will do that. He will put you in a situation where he will test your obedience because your obedience is the proof of your faith. We find the earliest illustration of this with Abraham, where God told Abraham... Take your son, your only begotten son, this beloved son Isaac, 
and take him to a place that I will show you and offering, offer him to me for a burnt offering. God made it clear. It wasn't just going to be like a presentation that we make of ourselves in Romans chapter 12 and Romans chapter 6 where we present our body a living sacrifice. This was to be for a burnt offering. And it is commended in the book of Hebrews because God tested Abraham's obedience and his obedience proved his faith. When you and I disobey God, it is a proof that we do not believe God. We're going to talk about that in just a bit. And there is one key element which stands between us and faith, which stands between us and obedience, and it holds us back many, many times, perhaps even in our lives most of the time, from obeying God and thus manifesting openly and clearly our faith in who he is and what he will do on our behalf. We'll get to those things in just a moment. We know some other things because we find them in other portions of the text. We know that Saul still had unsaved family members in Jerusalem. We learn about his sister's son, so he had at least a sister, and he had at least one nephew, and these would have been people for whom he was concerned. Dear people, you and I should be concerned for our lost family members as well. We should not be afraid of going even into the dangerous places to testify and witness to them. We should certainly pray for them. We should do everything that we can to share with them the good news of salvation that we know. Something else we know too, Saul would have had many connections still in Jerusalem with whom he would have wanted to share the gospel of Christ, even though it was personally dangerous to him. Saul had grown up in Jerusalem. Saul had sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Saul, no doubt, would have loved to have gone back and told his famous rabbi teacher about the Messiah and how he had already come. He had many contacts in Jerusalem. He was a well-known man. He was a diligent man. He was a man who made contacts all over. He perhaps even hoped that he might be able to share Christ with the Sanhedrin. Are you willing to share Christ with scary people? With people who might do you harm? I think that may have been part of Paul's motives as he went back to Jerusalem. Something else about Jerusalem, that was where the largest church of the time was located. Saul was a man who desired fellowship. We see that because when he gets there, he wants to join himself with the disciples. And when they rebuff him, he doesn't say, well, I don't want to join myself with the disciples anymore. I'll go start my own personal cult. He had an earnest desire for true Christian fellowship. Here is the largest church at the time. And it's rather interesting. Saul himself had been, when he was in Jerusalem, going from house to house, hailing both men and women, dragging them to trial and seeing them put to death. And yet there is a still a gigantic group of believers at Jerusalem. It reminds us of the two kinds of heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. The first half are all protected and are all in wonderful condition and all do mighty things and have all kinds of blessings. You get to the second half of Hebrews 11, it says, but others. And then it lists all these heroes of faith who were killed. All these heroes of faith who starved. All these heroes of faith who lived in dens and caves of the rocks. Jerusalem experienced both kinds of heroes of faith. There were those who, whom God blinded the eyes of Saul even before his Damascus Road experience so that he could not find them. And those are the ones to whom he wants to join himself now. There were those whom God said, you're ready to come home and he allowed Saul to find them, bring them to trial, and have them put to death. You and I do not know at this point in our lives which half of the list of the heroes of faith we will be in. You say, oh, I wouldn't be in a list of heroes of faith. No, you will be if you are a believer. You may be one of the weaker ones, but it says, they without us 
should not be made perfect or complete. God is working in your life to develop in you the character quality of faith instead of fear. God is working in your life to make you a valid part of that list added on to the end of Hebrews chapter 11. Jerusalem is also where Saul was most known and most feared by the Christians, the ones who had missed his holocaust, the ones who had missed his pogrom. You see, God was going to work in the lives of the believers in Jerusalem through Saul. They had managed to keep themselves hidden. It's like the old question, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> they had managed to stay hidden, even though Saul had been very zealous in looking for them. And so God was going to develop in them the character of courage instead of the character of fear. And he was going to bring Saul, bring him confrontationally, face to face with the believers in Jerusalem who knew him best, who knew his dangers best, who were most afraid of him, so that he would not only be able to transform Saul, but so that he could transform those believers. Did you know God is interested in transforming your life? Did you know that even now there are things that he wants to change in your life and he is going to bring you into the exact right circumstances and the exact right confrontations so that you will be more closely conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you want to be in the will of God? Do you want to be squarely in his will? We'll be talking about that in a few moments as we look at the key issue that is holding these believers apart. When other Christians don't trust you, how do you solve that problem on both sides of that? Number two, Saul wanted the same close fellowship that he had experienced at Damascus. He essayed to join himself unto the disciples. But it says they were all afraid of him. And it talks about the apostles later on, which means the apostles, as well as the other disciples in Jerusalem, were all afraid of him. Stop and think about that. These were men who were bold men. These who were men who a few chapters earlier had stood in the temple on the day of Pentecost and proclaimed the good news of the Messiah. This was Peter and John who in John chapter, uh, Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5 had stared down the Sanhedrin. They were all afraid of him. You know, the word fear shows up 385 times in the Bible. The word afraid shows up 189 times in the Bible. Fear is a serious issue in the Bible. Fear is, in fact, a basic human condition that goes back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3.10. And he said, Adam speaking to God, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. The very first fear shows up in the Garden of Eden immediately after the first sin. That should tell us something. And indeed, you and I have all experienced that. We have committed a sin, and then there has been a nagging fear in our heart that someone will find out. That somehow we will be caught. Well, God does. He reveals and manifests the hidden things of the heart of man. Paul says so in Romans. Sin always brings fear. The second thing we learn about fear is it comes when we have had inappropriate behavior. We find in Genesis 18.15, for example, and there are many illustrations of this, I'll give you only two, then Sarah denied 
Here are the three visitors stopping by the tent door. Two of them are angels on their way to Sodom. The third one is the Lord himself who speaks with Abraham and says you're going to have a son by your wife Sarah. And Sarah laughs. She thinks nobody knows. But when she's confronted, it says, then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, nay, but thou didst laugh. Fear comes when we have inappropriate behavior. Let me give you a very important principle verse on that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Four main principles in one verse dealing with fear. The first principle, there is no fear in love. Young people in particular. It's a very important principle to remember when you are in private locations with someone of the opposite sex. And that person says, I love you, and then wants to do things that you know are sin. There is no fear in love. There is plenty of fear when you get involved in lust. But the Word of God says there is no fear in love. If it is genuine love, you will not be afraid of what someone else will find out. You will not be afraid of what God would say if he were in the conversation at that point. He is, by the way, you know. Jesus Christ promised that he would be with us unto the end of the age. You cannot avoid him. He will never leave you nor forsake you. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of you because your body is the temple of the Spirit of God. There is no fear in love. The second principle is perfect love casts out fear. So what you want to develop is the kind of love that God has. Because when that is perfected in you, it drives fear away. The third principle is fear has torment. Do you enjoy being tormented? I mean, there are some people who are masochistic and they enjoy being beat up or beating others up. That is bizarre. Fear has torment. You have probably had in the past, I suspect, since most people do, something that's called night terrors. I think are brought on normally by demonic forces who are trying to attack. But fear came into your heart. You may have had other situations in which you were very, very afraid. And you were tormented mentally, even if you didn't experience anything physically. Fear itself produces the torment. Not just the results of what we fear, but fear itself produces the torment. The fourth thing that we learn in that verse, He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Fear stands between you and the growth that God would give you to where you are transformed into the image of Christ and whereby you can respond to him in love as he first loved you. Fear. But they were all afraid of him. It tells you something about the spiritual growth of the believers at Jerusalem. Though it was a healthy church, though it was a strong church, though it was a growing church, though it was a protected church, they still had one area of fear that they had not dealt with, and that was with the man whom they feared the most in Jerusalem, the man Saul. The next thing we learn about fear is that fear is focused on self and personal possessions. You know, if we could release our rights to ourselves and understand that we are slaves, bond slaves of Jesus Christ, 
That goes a long way to casting out fear because the master takes care of his servants. If we could but realize and understand that everything that we own belongs to God, we are not owners of anything, we are merely stewards of that which God has entrusted to our care. If we could give up our heart-grabbing covetousness for our possessions, we would not be afraid. We're so worried that something will happen to our car, or something will happen to our house, or something will happen to our possessions. You know, our bank account is shrinking. The stock market is crashing. Our bonds suddenly have become junk bonds, as many municipal bonds have now become junk bonds, because cities are defaulting on their bonds. Even what used to be considered safe investments. Major cities around the United States are in serious bankruptcy, which means that people who bought those bonds are going to receive pennies on their dollars, if anything at all. But if we understand that this all belongs to God, it relieves a major area of fear. Let me give you some illustrations. Genesis 32.7 Then was Jacob greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him, and the flocks, and the herds, and the camels into two bands. He wanted to hedge his bets there. He was worried about losing his stuff. Genesis 43.18 And the men were afraid because they brought unto Joseph's house, and they said, because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time we were brought in, that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us as bondsmen and our asses. They were worried about themselves. They were worried about their possessions. They were thinking bad things about Joseph because they didn't have all the facts. They had received promises from God and they were afraid of the one whom they called the Egyptian. Quit worrying about your stuff. Exodus 14.10 And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. They should have been crying out unto the Lord long before this. But they were afraid of Pharaoh. Was it a mighty army? Yes. Was he a powerful man? Yes. Did he have them cornered? Yes. Did they have any way to escape? No. Did they have any weapons? No. Did they have their wives and children and all their stuff with them? Yes. Was God able to solve the problem? You know the answer. The Shekinah glory stood between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of the Israelites all night long, and it was light for the Israelites, and it was utter darkness. The text describes it as a darkness that could actually be felt for the Egyptians. And then God told Moses, hold your rod out over the sea, and he did. And the sea parted. It parted at a place 118 miles wide. And the Israelites went over on dry land. And the Egyptians tried to follow them, but the Shekinah glory was in between. And the Lord looked out of it, saw that the Israelites were safely across. And then God closed the waters of the Red Sea, told Moses, hold out your rod again. And it drowned all the Egyptians. Dear people, who has chosen to be our leader? We talked about it this morning. Yahweh Nisi, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. It's a military banner. We've talked about that. How he himself leads his people into war and is Jesus Christ who does that. And he is the one pre uh, presented in Math uh, Revelation chapter 19, riding a white horse, going forth to war. A sword proceeding out of his mouth, which is the word of God. He smites the nations with a word. And we're simply riding white horses behind him, watching him win the battle. The scripture says, the Lord, that's Jehovah, is a man of war. Should we be afraid when he goes before us? But we're so worried about our stuff, which isn't ours anyway. There are consequences to that. We see that in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 25. The parable of the stewards who had been given talents and were supposed to multiply them. And the third man says, who had the one talent, And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. 
Lo, there thou hast that is thine. And you know the words of the Lord in return to that servant. You are a wicked and slothful servant. Is that how God views our fears? He's given us resources. He's given us talents. He's given us abilities. But we say, I'm afraid to use those for the Lord because I might get criticized or I might be embarrassed by doing it or something bad might happen. And What are the words of Jesus? Thou wicked and slothful servant. Fear will lead you there if you do not use what God has given you for his glory. Fear also tends to blame God for not doing his job of protecting us. Listen back there to that narrative of Joseph's brothers making their trips back and forth to buy food in Egypt. And as they come back on that first trip, they stop for the evening, open one of the sacks to give food to the animals, and they discover a sack of money in the mouth of the sack of corn. Here's what they said. He said unto his brethren, The money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, Now get this. They've just got their money back. And they say, what is this that God hath done unto us? Fear moves us stupidly to blame God for not doing his job of protecting us. Here we have a whole group of Christians at Jerusalem who have been living through a persecution and they're scared silly. And they were pretty good at hiding out. They had some kind of resources whereby they'd had their secret places in their houses or their secret tunnels or panels in the wall or whatever they did. But now they're afraid because the chief persecutor wants to join himself to them. How do they know that he's not merely a plant? How do they know that he's not merely trying to get a list of names and addresses so that he can then go and get them? Hey, that's what the communists do. They infiltrate churches. Well, that's what the homosexuals do. They infiltrate churches. Hey, that's what the Muslims do. They infiltrate churches too. So then they can burn the church and kill the Christians. Dangerous stuff. But there's fear, and it's an accusation against God for not doing his job. It came to pass, as they emptied their sacks, that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when both they and their fathers saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. God has just done something good for them. <laughs> God has just blessed them through their brother Joseph, whom they don't know yet as Joseph. And rather than saying, praise God, look at this miraculous thing that has happened. Look at the blessing that God has given to us. They're afraid and they blame God for doing something bad. How often do we do that? God brings something good into our lives and we can't believe it. And so we're suspicious, we don't trust it, and we're afraid. We find even the disciples had that problem. And as they were going in the way up to Jerusalem, this is as they are approaching for the final week of the life of Christ. As they were going up to Jerusalem, Jesus went before them. And they were amazed as they all followed him, and they were afraid. Jesus himself, visible, walking on earth, the one whom they had seen raise the dead, heal lepers, heal the sick, Walk on water. He's right there in front of them. And they're walking behind him, dragging their heels and scared out of their wits. Dear people, when you are following Jesus, do you ever need to be afraid? I think not. The only appropriate fear in Scripture is the fear of the Lord. And, of course, Paul 
being an Old Testament scholar, would have understood these commands, and this is what gave him courage after his conversion. Exodus 3, 6, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. That is an appropriate fear. The fear of the Lord is the only appropriate fear. You heard me read this verse this morning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Where must you start? You must start with the fear of the Lord. God is greater than anyone. Deuteronomy 7.19, the great temptations which thine eyes saw and the signs and the wonders and the mighty hand and the stretched out arm whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out, so shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people of whom thou art afraid. Don't worry about people. Do you not remember what God has done? Do you not remember who he is? Do you not remember his majestic power? Do you not remember his character? Do you not understand who God is? And if you are one of his, you are safe in the hollow of his hand. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Deuteronomy 31.6 Joshua 1.9 Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. <laughs> what promises we have in the word of God. God uses men of courage who are not afraid. For example, Gideon's 300, Judges 7, 3. Now, therefore, he gives the command. God tells him, tell the people, I don't want any chickens here. You know, this is not for chickens. This is for beef. All right. Now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And they returned to the people 22,000. 22,000 chickens went home. God cut it down even further until he reached 300 men. And with that won a great victory. Courage comes from faith and removes stress. How many of you have ever felt like you were under stress? I think we could all raise our hands to that. How many of us have ever felt that we were under pressure? There was too much to get done and too little time to do it in. There was somebody demanding something from us and we just didn't have the energy to do it. But it was mandated. Did you know that courage comes from faith and that removes stress? Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, be not afraid of them. God is with you and will not fail you. Deuteronomy 31.8 And the Lord, he it is that goeth before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be thou dismayed. That's worried and stressful. Proverbs 3.24 When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. When you're under stress, when you're under pressure, you have horrible dreams, don't you? You toss and turn, you lie awake at night, you can't figure out how to solve the problem. You're busy trying to resolve issues within your own strength. When you walk by faith, you can lie down. You won't be afraid that something will get you in the night. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Proverbs 3.25 Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. Acts 18.9 then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. Hebrews 11.23 By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months by his parents because they saw that he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Did you see that in every one of these passages, it connects faith with being unafraid, with having no stress, with having no worry. It's faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is the heart of the Reformation. If you walk in the flesh, you will have constant fears. Fears about your own person, fears about your own junk. Walking by faith, we know that God will take care of us and protect us 
and keep us in this world as long as it is his will, and at the right time he will take us home. Faith means we trust God to meet our needs day by day by day by day, and we don't have to amass wealth to take care of us. God can take care of us just as well if we have nothing than if we have all kinds of stuff. We're afraid of suffering. Listen to what Peter says, but, and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. That is worried. The scripture is loaded with these kinds of commands. It looks like our time is running out. I still have three more pages to go. Let me just summarize a few of them. Fear is a particular temptation for women and weak men. We find that over in 1 Peter chapter 1, 3, verses 1 through 7. Verse 6 in particular, Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. It's a word for panic. Fear brings panic, doesn't it? I can remember early back in our marriage, um, and we didn't have anything. We were poorer than church mice. And there was all the stress and all the pressures of not having stuff, not getting very much money. And uh, I made rule number one. Rule number one is don't panic. Rule number one, don't panic. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Obedient preparation and being in the center of God's will removes fear and stress. Ah, just one illustration. Proverbs 31, 21, the godly woman. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. Obedient preparation, doing what you're supposed to do in the function that God gave you, in the location God gave you, in the position of either under authority or in authority that God gave you. Be prepared doing what you're supposed to do in that situation. It removes fear. One of the things that I think all of us need to learn is fear increases as we get older unless it is actively countered by faith. One illustration of that, very clearly stated in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 5. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, that is your hair turns white, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, you get so weak that even a grasshopper is a weight, and desire shall fail, that means no longer the physical desires of your youth that you had, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. As we get older, we need to guard against fear. Very appropriate message for the majority of this congregation. How we fear, how we worry, how we're stressed. Faith removes fear. Be actively aware of the fact that fear will come upon you more and more as you get older unless you counter it actively with faith. The fear of man not only brings a snare, as we've heard many times, but it also causes injustice. Deuteronomy 1.17 Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's. And that the cause is too hard for you, bring it unto me, Moses speaking, and I will hear it. Fear brings injustice. Fear should come when we're disobedient to the will of God. Romans 13, 3 and 4. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou not then be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he, that is the ruler, is a minister of God to thee for good. Now he's talking about Caesar. Caesar was a bad guy. But in the sovereign plan of God... He is a minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Something we need to learn in our culture today. Because of many who are in positions of authority that we don't consider to be ministers of God, but God says they are. When you are not in the center of the will of God, you should be afraid. 
How is the believer to respond to the many sources of fear? Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Trust, that's faith. Whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Second Timothy 1, 7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You lose power. You, you lose love. You lose a sound mind. You remember what First John said? It said, perfect love casteth out fear. Fear causes you to lose power. It causes you to lose love. It causes you to lose a sound mind. You make stupid judgments when you're afraid. Psalm 56, 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. The answer to every situation of fear is trust in the Lord. This is how Jesus put it. I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, they have no more that they can do. He says it again in Matthew 10, 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's not the devil, that's God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, remember? Don't be afraid of what men can do to you. But have the fear of God. He's the one who's in control. Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, ye therefore, ye are more value than many sparrows. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Well, that tells you who we trust when we're afraid. There are many other passages that I'd written down here. There's actually, when you look up the command, fear not, it occurs 63 times in the Bible because we, as people, by human nature, are fearful. You see, fear comes when we're expecting something bad to happen or when we refuse to believe, as we've seen already, that God is in control and causing something good to happen. I gave, gave many references there, which we'll skip over, where people are commanded to fear not. The very first one is back in Genesis 15. God had to start telling people fear not all that way back in the days of Abraham. Even Paul had to be told on occasion not to fear. Acts 27, 24, we're getting toward the end of books of Acts at that point. The angel stood by him at night saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee, thee all them that sail with thee. Was that a scary situation? Being on a boat that had no supplies, that all the goods that were being brought to be sold had been tossed overboard, they even threw the tackling of the ship overboard, trying to make it light enough to keep above the waves. Everybody was bailing 24 hours a day. The ship was tossing and turning. Everybody was sick. Nobody had eaten for days. Would you be scared if that happened to you? If you were riding a very small boat in the middle of a massive hurricane, the perfect storm, The angel stands by Paul and says, fear not. Not only must you be brought to Rome, but I'm going to give you, as a sign of that, the life of 276 people on board this ship. You see, people, we serve a sovereign God. Jesus is the sovereign God who controls the winds and the waves. And he has promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. That's a pretty good promise from the God of heaven who created everything that is. Fear destroys faith. Well, summarizing quickly, what were the believers there missing in Jerusalem because they did not want to receive Saul, they were missing fellowship. They were missing Bible teaching. They were missing insights into the inner working of the Sanhedrin because Paul had been an insider and knew what they would do when they met, what their future agenda was. They were missing identification with the greatest evangelist and church planter who ever lived. They were missing insights into the greatest Christian theologian who ever lived. They were missing insights into the grace of God to the most sinful of men. Paul says, I was the chief of sinners because I persecuted the church of God. But the grace of God saved the chief of sinners. And they were missing 
the fellowship with this man and understanding how God transforms lives. God was transforming Saul's life. He was going to use Saul to transform the lives of the believers in Jerusalem. What makes other people distrust us? They believe not that he was a disciple. We have just four things here that I've listed, and I won't cover them in detail, but I'll list them for you. Human nature that is prone to fear even when there is nothing to fear. We call it parano uh, paranoia, irrational fears. That makes other people distrust us. They've got a human nature. They're prone to fear, even when there's nothing to fear. Number two, selfishness in protecting what we own, who we are, what we think are our own best interests. Number three, what makes other people distrust us, what the other person reveals himself to be, will either cause or reject trust. If a person reveals himself to be untrustworthy, he won't be trusted. If a person reveals himself to be trustworthy, he may be trusted. Number four, cynical refusal to believe that someone can change. How do you make other people trust you? You need a daysman. You need a go-between. Ananias was the daysman in Damascus. Barnabas was the daysman in Jerusalem. We don't have time to talk about it, but it's beautiful how he brought them, brought Saul to the disciples. He had a go-between, someone who was already trusted, someone who will act as the go-between and vouch for your integrity. This is a very important point. Lack of trust develops when there is a lack of integrity. Do you have integrity? Do you have integrity all the time? Or do you let people down? You know, every time you let people down, you build more distrust. Little things like not keeping your word. Little things like insistently being late. Little things like failure to finish what you start. Little things like being unfaithful when someone is relying upon you. Proverbs 25, 29. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. You relied on somebody and they failed you. It was like a broken tooth. I've had a broken tooth. And I can remember the pain when I bit down on a popcorn ball that had a seed still in it, unpopped corn, and it broke my tooth. And it took me a year and a half of going over to the dental school in Philadelphia to get that repaired by a dental student. Confidence in an unfaithful man is like a broken tooth. It causes incredible pain to the one who is depending on you. A broken foot or a tooth out of a foot out of joint. Have you ever been walking along and twisted your ankle? I can remember being back at seminary and carrying a huge armload of reel-to-reel -reel tapes to be mailed off to different radio stations all over the country where they would play our seminary radio program. And I was on the stairs, and I hit the edge of the step and twisted my ankle. It was some of the most excruciating pain that I'd ever felt in my life. I fell down the stairs, dropped all these huge cartons of, of tapes, and that pain was with me for years. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth or a foot out of joint. The desire of a man is his kindness, and a poor man is better than a liar. You tell people you'll do something, you don't do it. Very soon they give up on trusting you. How do you make people trust you? Second thing, you need to have a radical change in your life. Last week we talked about when you got saved, how did it change your life? It will change your life if you're really saved. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It is a radical change of life, not a touch-up on the edges. Trust is a matter of faith. It's based on what the object of faith reveals about himself or itself. What has God revealed about himself? You have it in the Bible. Can we trust the living God who made all things. That's what the focus of this message has been. 
Faith, not fear. Learning to believe that we have a God who cares about us. Learning to turn everything over to him. Our life, our health, our wealth, our strength, our prosperity, our honor, our position, our employment, our family, everything that we are, everything that we have. Trust him. Jesus never fails. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word, the many passages of scripture that tell us that we need to learn to trust you when we are afraid to trust in you. How we thank you, Father, that perfect love casts out fear. And when we love you and serve you and are faithful to you, when we walk in the center of your will, there is no fear. You are the God who is there. You've promised that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Father, as all of us are getting older, we know that that temptation to fear will increase with increasing age. Your word declares it. And yet it can be actively countered by walking by faith every day, every moment, every hour. Father, we pray that you will take your word as it has gone forth tonight, that you will bury it deep in our hearts, that you will cause it to grow and bear fruit, and that we might be known as men and women of God who walk by faith, not by sight. We keep our eyes focused on eternity, on Jesus Christ who has gone before us, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye become wearied and faint in your minds. Father, how we thank you for the promises, for the exhortations, and for the strength that you give to overcome that which is fearful, to overcome the world, the flesh, the devil, the worries that are all related to this world, because we've kept our eyes on eternity. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.